Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, I have to uh, thank the organizer committee for inviting me. And uh, I'm, um, first of all, I have to apologize. I'm Justin Brewer. And uh, I'm, I'm not coming from the medicine. And uh, that's the reason why I'm, uh, why I'm able to talk about uh, beers, special beers, like gluten-free beers. And uh, why are we focusing on that? Because uh, we are interested always, we are interested in creating new type of beers and we are interested in beers which have functionalities. And uh, for us it is uh, much more easier to focus on something where we get rid of something, in that case gluten. And uh, because the polyphenols of course are very, very interesting and we are focusing on that as well. But we are not coming from the medicine side and we cannot do clinical studies yeah, to prove them. We can just say we have them and uh, we can enhance them and um, find all these other interesting functionalities like uh, taste and color and so on. Okay, gluten-free beers. <coughs> um, what's the problem with gluten? Uh, the problem is that there are a lot of people which uh, suffer on a celiac disease. It's really a lot. Um, I wrote here 1%, um, estimated 1% of the population. Um, I have heard other numbers, other scores, 1% to 2% uh, over the whole population, and it's, it's a little bit different. If you look in Japan, you will find uh, 0%, but um, the Japanese people do not have that much gluten in their normal diet. So it could be that they have genetically uh, a lot of people which would suffer on celiac disease if they would get in contact with the gluten. Uh, it's an autoimmune enteropathy and it is, as I told you, genetically uh, triggered. It is um, very, very um, problematic if you look on the symptoms. Um, the, the problem is um, what's the, where's the point? I'm sorry. If I have, I have two pictures from the Willy from your <laughs> intestine. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks. I have two pictures from the Willy uh, of your intestine, and the left one is the normal, where you have. Uh, um, that's from an a normal uh, person and you have a an, an huge surface where you can uh, uptake all the normal diet, everything what you, what you eat. And if you have uh, celiac disease in, in a uh, later state, you have the problem that at the end the surface is very, very small of the intestine and it's a kind of tube and where you do not have the surface to uptake uh, all these vitamins and and other things you want to have and you you need to have and that's a problem with the symptoms um, that they are so different it can start every at, at every time in your um, in your uh, <coughs> in your personal life yeah it can very start very very early and and sometimes uh, the mm, doctors uh, only detected when you are 80 or something like that. Yeah, and it's, it's very, very different what you can see here. Yeah, <coughs> and, and it is, uh, you, you can have some typical malabsorption syndromes like chronic dirty, weight loss, and so on. A typical presentation like dermatitis hepatiformis. That's the only way where you not only have to uh, look on the gluten, there is, uh, really in, in pharmacy help, but only in that case. Otherwise, that is very, very important. Uh, you have to have a strict lifelong elimination of gluten. And that brings me yeah, to, the, to the next problem. Uh, what does it mean, an uh, lifelong el an elimination? Yeah. And uh, when we when we focus on special beers, where we try to get rid of something, we have not to prove with clinical studies. 
that something is uh, that the product is uh, really perfect and everything is is good for the patient. No, uh, when we do that, we have to prove that the measuring method has to be perfect. And that is a little bit the problem. Uh, we have a method, we have two methods. We have, an, a competi sorry. we have a competitive ELISA and we have a sandwich ELISA. They are recommended and uh, uh, I agree in, in many cases that they are really good, but the last uh, research projects we have made is that we have problems for example, to follow over the whole process, and we have a long process if we make beer, to follow the gluten content over the whole process. And we cannot switch between the two different ELISA tests. The competitive is much more, uh, is much better with uh, non-hydrolyzed products, and the sandwich ELISA is much more able to detect in hydrolyzed products. Beer is a hydrolyzed product. If you, if you find some scores um, in the publications concerning the gluten content in beer, it is, um, I, I'm not absolutely sure that you can believe everything. If, if they are high, you can believe it. If they are really low, and the uh, Codex Alimentarius says lower than 20 ppm is gluten-free, then I would say it's a little bit difficult. And uh, <coughs> the uh, countries like Australia and New Zealand, they say it has to be lower than the detection uh, limit. And that is five milligram per kilogram, five ppm. And some of the researchers there use other methods, use GZMS and so on. And I would a little bit trust more of these results. But unfortunately, we are not able to do that. And that is a little bit the background why we focused um, on a special type of these gluten-free beers. But first of all, I want to show you in this very important slide which possibilities we have to produce gluten-free beers. First of all, we can go into the raw materials. We can use the traditional raw materials like barley. Barley is um, up to 90% uh, the cereal for beer. And we can use GMO barley, but as we all know, it's, it's really not that well accepted. We have some interesting um, results concerning that, but it's, it's not that easy and we do not have any variety which is able to substitute. Now, then a very, very interesting um, section is uh, the breeding. There's an Australian um, research project, CRSIO, with Crispin Howard, and they breeded an ultra-low gluten-free uh, barley. The latest results would say, yes, it is gluten-free at the end, but we are not really that satisfied concerning uh, all the other aspects like foam, like uh, foam is of course very important. Yeah, foam is the indicator for beer. There are not much many other beverages all over the world which have foam on it. Uh, beer has and uh, foam is in some cases, uh, you need for foam in some cases, you need proteins and uh, Gluten, sorry, gluten is protein, and, and if it is missing, um, you breed not only gluten away. Yeah, that's that's a problem. Um, we are in good way, I think so. These Australians are in good way, but it is, uh, yeah, the last good variety is is missing. I will first of all come to uh, the degradation of gluten before I come to this. Uh, um, part, we can, we can modify, of course, during the malting and the brewing process, the gluten. Gluten is protein, and we have, if, if, if you really look on the whole malting and brewing process, you degradate proteins all over the time, a lot of, yeah, and uh, that's a normal process. 
Yeah, we have in the beginning, we have up to 10% of protein, and at the end, we have maybe 1%. Yeah, and, and we lost these, pr these proteins in different steps with sedimentation, filtration that is uh, used for uh, making biomass of the yeast and so on. And why not enhance that? And there are some breweries uh, who uh, focus on that, of course, but then we have the same problem as always, how to measure it. But it's, it could be I'm absolutely sure that there are normal beers available here on the market which are gluten-free with respect to the Codex Alimentarius lower than 20 ppm. But not too much brewers are focusing on that. <coughs> the next way is to use an enzymati enzymatic treatment. Very, very interesting. Uh, there's one commercial product that is here the transglutaminase. <coughs> you can use the transglutaminase to complex the gluten and the gluten will be sedimented and filtrated and you get rid of it. From the technical point of view, it is, it is possible, of course. At the end, we have the same problem. The measurement, is it, is it really gluten-free? I know one brewery who is producing that, it's in Bavaria, it's interesting, there's a purity law and they're using an enzyme, <coughs> uh, but they do not call it beer, but it is. Yeah, it's, it's malty, it's hopped, it has foam and it has a little bit of alcohol and uh, that is beer. And um, they, they sell it since many years and they do not have had any problems with uh, the consumers who are drinking it. And it's a very good product. The other possibility is a very, very interesting project which uh, was uh, made in Weinstefan as well with Professor Köhler um, and uh, our chair, uh, using a special proteinase which is uh, enhanced during the germination by the normal process of making mold. Yeah, it's a pronyl endopeptidase <coughs> and this enzyme is in a good way able to degradate the gluten during the fermentation process. You have to be aware not to have too much alcohol when we, <coughs> when we use this enzyme. The first uh, results are very, very good. We have still the problem of the measurement of gluten, but um, if, we, if we have a look on the old the other quality aspects of a beer. It's, it's a very, very interesting project and uh, hopefully it uh, will be going on. We of course can use other enzymes and there is for example an enzyme from a producer, um, I think in the Netherlands, um, it's called Brewers Clarix, uh, which cuts the proteins behind of the proline um, and uh, it's one of the amino acids and uh, that's the place where we have these toxic peptides, these toxic peptides which are the problem for people who suffer on celiac disease. So what I showed you um, here is uh, that there are uh, a lot of interesting ways to produce gluten-free beers but in most of these cases, we have the problem of the measurement of gluten uh, in the hydrolyzed product. And so I would like to focus here on these alternative raw materials, not only on honey, sugar, molasses. This is, of course, a problem because of uh, so many legislations. Uh, is it beer if you use honey, sugar, molasses? What I want to focus is on gluten-free cereals and gluten-free pseudo cereals. And not only because they are gluten-free, of course that's the main aspect here for me, I want to focus on that because they are very, very interesting in so many different aspects like, uh, as <coughs> sorry, like aspects um, due to the climate change and to biodiversity and to producing really complete new products. 
And so the next few slides will uh, get a little bit deeper in, in some ideas, only with three different uh, serials. It's a little bit, uh, I have a uh, main topic here with, um, the, uh, with the millets and with sorghum. Just here for you to understand, on the left side, the left column, these are the cereals which uh, contain gluten. I know oat is still a little bit a problem. Oat is uh, the problem that, uh, that there is one clinical study where one patient did not accept uh, oat gluten um, and he, he still suffers from celiac disease. Uh, it, of course, it did some problem and you have, to, uh, you have to know that. In Scandinavia, I do like, they wrote on the labels, it is gluten-free containing oat. Uh, because if you use oat, you can make much more foods and beverages and beer, of course, um, instead of only using these different cereals and pseudo cereals. Uh, as you may know, um, we are not that familiar to, to pastas, pizzas, and uh, to needles and uh, noodles and what else, and beers, uh, which are made of that. We here in Europe. But if you go, uh, if you, if you go to uh, other continents, you will find a lot of that. If I focus on, on these different cereals, I first of all have to solve different problems. The first problem is they are um, solid and this, and I want to have a fluid at the end. And uh, a very, very good way to do that is using all these enzymes which normally, naturally, are uh, created during the molting, during the termination. And so I Get the, I was using the way of molting and mashing like the production of beer and whiskey as we know that. And when I said um, um, that I focus on these special uh, millets and, and sorghum, um, they are very, very interesting in other continents. And I have a very long table, and I'm just going, just to show you, you have all the slides on your USB stick. And there are so many traditional beverages, alcohol-free and, and alcohol-containing, um, from Africa, from Asia, uh, with these different cereals like millet, sorghum, and so on. And most of them are gluten-free. Here, for example, is a beer with, uh, in, from Germany, <laughs> Bavaria as well, um, Purity Law, as I said. And, and they use millet, but it's, it's the same. They do not call it beer. <laughs> you, can, you can mix it up with some bananas or something like that as you like it, like the Mbegi beer. Here's a an, an picture of this Mbegi beer as well. And it's a foam on it, as, as I told you. Always, beer has foam. Sometimes they drink with the straws. Yeah, it's a kind of filtration. It's, it's very interesting, and you can find a lot of these... Uh, different beverages. These are very traditional turbid products, but uh, with a very interesting and good smell. The only problem of most of them is the shelf life is maybe only five days long. So um, the first problem I, uh, what we have had is um, what is about the storage? If, if we cook in, uh, if we look in these uh, countries, um, we of course, um, it, it can cause the next problem uh, if it is too wet, yeah, and so we have mold. But uh, in, in many cases, I, I was in Ethiopia and, and I've seen these jars, um, these jars uh, with 200 kilogram of teff. Teff is a very small uh, millet, and in, in one of them, uh, the teff was over 30 years and no problem with the mold, and if anybody of you was in Ethiopia, uh, the rainy re season is uh, very, very wet, and you can, yeah, you can fix that problem. No, nope. um, but that is very important uh, not to release any mycotoxins because of uh, healthy aspects, because of gushing as well. Gushing when you open the flask, uh, the bottom, um, the beer comes out 
too quickly. Yeah, Teff is the first. Um, only I'm, I'm slipping through the slides. Very, very small kernels. A thousand kernels does weight 0.3 to 0.4 gram. It's coming from Ethiopia and we malted this Teff. It is possible. You, you need good glasses to see them, but it is possible. And we produce, and that's the main important thing, we produce in this, this uh, research with a Lactobacillus amylolyticus, in that case an alcohol-free product, uh, we can switch completely. It was a special project, alcohol-free in that case. Uh, it, is, it is some kind of alcohol, it is another possibility to produce an alcohol-free beer. We used this mold, we try to find out the kinetics and we did find out the kinetics of the lactobacillus and um, we made some sensory trials uh, with this product and uh, it's, it's the sensory uh, results are here in the spider diagram. Um, the dark blue line is the word, very, very sweet. And um, if you look on these alcohol-free beers and on these uh, soft drinks, and very, very important fact is the ratio, the so-called ratio. It's an, an quality aspect. It's a ratio between uh, the sweetness and the sourness. And it has to be well balanced, and it's completely different to all these different uh, beverages, and that was our main focus. And we could find a very good ratio uh, with the Selectobacillus uh, when we um, differed uh, the word ratio and what we can could find if we mix it up with pineapple, for example, that was typical because pineapple is a very, very famous product of Ethiopia as well. It was paid by the Ethiopian government and that's the reason why we have done that with teff and pineapple. And uh, we could create uh, a very well-balanced product, gluten-free. So um, we could find the uh, kinetics of this lactic acid uh, formation and uh, um, in short, it, the pH was very low. Uh, it is, but with a, a rest of sweetness, we have had a sensory uh, well and well tasting product. And, and low pH is, is very, very important for us as well for the storage of this product. Yeah, if the lower the pH, it has to be lower than 5.0, and then you have a an, an good shelf life concerning the microbiology. You have a stable product. TEF has a problem. TEF has a problem because there is a patent in Europe, uh, and these... Uh, it is a patent with the agreement of the Ethiopian government. I do not know why. And I really do not know uh, how anybody uh, did accept that um, because it's a patent of a natural product. And um, so if, if you want to have a patent on the world, uh, it, it, yeah, maybe it's possible to do that. Uh, the good thing is it is not for malted to teff. And so that was another... Uh, idea for us to do that research, make mold, make m a good mesh out of it and ferment it. The next is the prosum millet. It is a very typical um, millet here in Europe. And um, we have done a little bit the same. We uh, have done a big, big variety, variety trials and uh, the it is, it is coming from maybe from China, um, but we, we have done some variety trials with a lot of varieties from Russia and from uh, Australia and Germany. And we did find out that uh, one of them, the wild brown variety is, is the, um, the best for that, what we wanted to have. And we have done some um, kilning trials and that's the drying process during molting and some uh, amylolytic trials, where with some meshing trials, where we degraded the starch to fermentable sugars, and so on. And, and what we did find out at the end with the sweet word, uh, that we fermented it with different kind of uh, 
microorganisms like yeasts and uh, lacto lacti lactobacillus strains that we could create wonderful different products at the end. We have had, um, if, if we used a Bavarian wheat beer yeast, it was a kind of Bavarian wheat beer. If we used an ale yeast, it was a kind of ale product and so on. It, that was really great to see and uh, it was really satisfying. Three minutes, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, it was very easy to substitute. Yeah, and that's, that's the main uh, conclusion with the pros and millet. Coming to sorghum, sorghum is very, very often used, if you have seen in the table I've shown you before. It's maybe coming from Ethiopia as well. There are so many different varieties. One, uh, you can distinguish between a tannin rich and tannin uh, less variety, um, different uses. Um, what we have done with these uh, varieties, um, we, we have done the same trials as well, making a good mold out of it, and that is really not that easy. We use for that uh, the response surface methodology where we varied three different um, parameters in three different steps, and then we have a good calculation in between, and we have had different responses. In that special case, we focused on bioactive compounds as well. You can add so many responses as you want to have. Um, and we did find out at the end you get these wonderful slides and then you can say, okay, that's the optimum where I have to focus on. With these parameters, I did get that responses. And uh, that's, that's the result out of that, uh, the molting regime and the different responses we did get. And it is not that what we expect and what we want to have from barley mold, but it's close to that. And so we can substitute in sorghum mold uh, instead of barley mold as well. So um, coming, coming to the end, to the overall conclusion, of course, I will first of all start with the problems. As uh, of course, these products do have a problem as well, the problem of contamination during the whole process, starting on the field, starting on the transport, uh, in the transport starting in, and then coming to the storage vessels and uh, to the roller mill and so on. All, uh, over all the time, you have the problem that you have to clean it up, that nothing gluten containing is in there and if you um, if you ferment and of course I did, did ferment over the whole process uh, over um, the whole research project um, you have to be aware that the lactic acid bacteria or the yeast did not ferment before of that in a gluten containing world if it would be like that you, you add some gluten to the new product and uh, that's really a problem. You have to be aware of that. The gluten contamination is, can cause a uh, um, problem. But the, our trials, our comprehensive trials, have shown this, that these different beverage, uh, that these different cereals can produce a lot of different beverages, not only alcohol-free beers, all the beers we wanted to have and we have focused on. These beers were all gluten-free and uh, <coughs> we, yeah, there are many other very interesting technological steps we, we solved during these processes that we enhanced the amylolytic enzymes and so on, that, that we used the RSM um, the response surface methodology is a very, very powerful tool to look on these uh, things. Uh, but at the end, I want to, to say it is a very, very important thing to, to look on these uh, different cereals because of the biodiversity. If you look on the fields in Germany, for example, it's, it's I would say it's really boring. Yeah? You see maize or corn, you see wheat, and, and that's it and nothing else yeah and 
and people wonder that we get more and more serial diseases and problems. But if you, if you would do much more in that direction, you have not that much problems. The next point is the climate change. Uh, in, in the lower Saxonia, they, they have since many years the problem, it's, it's not too much water over the, um, over the time, over the summer time, and so they have to water the cereals. And if you use cereals like sorghum, for example, they are that much drought resistant that uh, it could solve the problem and we will have this climate change and we have to focus on all these things. So, I, at the end, I have to thank a lot of people like Ahmed Hassani, Mekonen, Geprimarium von Ethiopia, Roland Kerpes, Eike Arendt, she's from the UCC in Ireland, and Fritz Jakob, my new boss, and uh, you for your kind uh, attention. Thank you.